morning everyone this is zahir alam khan assistant professor i welcome you all on board for the fourth day of our faculty development program organized by civil engineering department gates institute of technology i hope everyone is safe and protected so i wish all the three day fdp programs were very useful to all the participants from across the india and abroad so in the same way today we have another interesting topic from civil engineering that is importance of surveys in civil engineering and latest trends in topographic mapping using gis and remote sensing so we have today our resource person mr dr ch ramesh naidu sir who is an eminent speaker and faculty working in gayatri vidya parishad college of engineering vishakhapatnam so before i hand over this session to him i would enlighten him a little on his experiences and his career sir has finished his btech in civil engineering from nagarjuna university in the year 1991 and then he finished his masters in geo engineering from andhra university in 1996 and sir had his phd from water resources which is interlinked with gis and remote sensing from jain to hyderabad in 2016 sir is having a total of 25 years of experience in which 20 years was industry experience and 5 years he was into teaching so before entering into the teaching field dr ramesh naidu sir has worked as associate vice president in rb associates in hyderabad for 10 years sir is also a life member of indian society of remote sensing iirs dehradun and the life member of institution of engineers in india sir i is also an visiting faculty in engineering staff college of india hyderabad voluntary hyderabad and center for environmental development trivandra so now i would like to take the privilege to introduce our resource person dr ch ramesh naidu sir to take over the session and continue with his presentation over to you sir yeah thank you jahir uh, for briefing for nice briefing am i audible am i audible you are audible sir please continue sir okay so before i start presenting the topic i would like to say thanks to uh, the management of gates institute of technology and the principal and i would also like to say thanks to uh, civil engineering department and its staff yes, including ritesh rajodi and uh, my friend dr tc venkat reddy is also with you uh, for giving this opportunity to present here uh, uh, let me straight away go to my topic the topic is importance of surveys in civil engineering and latest trends in topographic mapping see when you see when you observe this topic you can find out three keywords one is surveys another one is civil engineering and the third one is topographic mapping and mostly because of the uh, uh, faculty it is a faculty development program uh, most of you are from civil engineering domain uh, and need not explain the basics of our definition of civil engineering surveys and topographic mapping but subsequently you will come to know what exactly these three keywords when i really go through the uh, presentation topics as a civil engineer normally when you uh, plan a major civil engineering infrastructure project as a civil engineer you need to cross so many phases and the typical life cycle of civil engineering project looks something like this and a civil engineer is an interesting area with so many areas or verticals and a large 
a domain. It is a large domain with various verticals. And when you talk about these verticals, it may be transportation, it may be water resources, or it can be uh, uh, what, uh, or it can be uh, some other domain like uh, uh, transportation, water resources, and uh, structures is also another domain. Uh, and these uh, three domains are very important for civil engineering. And when you see uh, the typical life cycle of civil engineering, it starts with data collection. It includes surveys. And uh, later on, after data collection and surveys, you can straight away go and plan your infrastructure. And then once, you, once planning is done, you can go straight away to the designs. And after designs, you will have construction. But the solution of uh, uh, plans and designs must be uh, and a sustainable uh, solution is required uh, in terms of uh, social sustainability, environmental sustainability, as well as uh, economic sustainability is very important nowadays. And then uh, finally, operation and OM operations are also important because after establishing the infrastructure, you also should maintain the infrastructure properly. That is also a key role is playing nowadays in the operation and maintenance part also is very important. That phase is also very important. And uh, considering all these phases, uh, how do you uh, prepare uh, for establishing an infrastructure? Obviously, you are required to collect the data and do surveys. Survey, unless you do surveys, it is impossible to cross subsequent hurdles or phases. So surveys are very important. And the data is very important here. Uh, as a civil engineer, you need to verify all this data before planning alternatives, best alternatives. And then finally, you can go designs and construction. And one more thing is, uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, when you want to propose a new canal command area in your district or in a river basin, obviously, you need to study all these details. The right side, uh, I have mentioned some details, topography, soil, geology, water resources, land use, census, uh, census data, climate data, property. Property is nothing but land information. It is very important, land information, land acquisition process and all. Land information database is also very important. Uh, for that, you need to do surveys. See, all this information is, we cannot get straight away through an organization. Sometimes you need to do surveys and sometimes you need to do a uh, collection of uh, existing information and uh, interpret the information with the new collected information on ground. And all this database, you need to collect it before proceeding to the uh, conceptual plan and designs. Okay. So, and out of these many, these many data, topography plays an important role. We, uh, my 25, 30 years of experience, in my 25, 35, 30 years of experience, I never proceeded uh, without a topographical map to plan an infrastructure or to design an infrastructure. So topographical maps are very important. And, and in fact, topography maps are a reference for all the other database, like soil, geology. You can somewhat interpret from the topographical maps to some extent and water resources data is already available in the topographical maps. Land use also is available. And census data, climate data may not be available in the topographical maps. And property data is the other database that we need to collect from the revenue and the land reports department. And uh, uh, transportation data uh, is also available in the topographical maps. So most of the data that you want to refer for planning a, an infrastructure or designing an infrastructure, topographical maps are very basic requirements, prerequisite for uh, proceeding to plans and designs. And this is my presentation plan. Uh, most of the topics, uh, surveys and survey of India topo maps, the first topic is uh, large scale versus small scale mapping. Uh, I'll uh, try to uh, give you some brief uh, introduction on what is uh, the scale of the map and the large scale and small scale mapping. And latest technologies after discussing uh, that one we will discuss the latest technologies to prepare topographical maps and triangulation and ground control points are also very important before we do surveys and processing of satellite images, aerial photographs and drone photographs. 
and that comes into remote the remote sensing part and georeferencing the images once you acquire the images you have to start working on images with softwares and hardware and inputs and outputs so what sort of inputs that we have on the <coughs> project software and hardware is also one more component uh, we need to discuss after uh, discussing all these concepts and uh, the final one is gis and applications so study on storm water management with epo swm and gis see all these topics we will uh, uh, try to discuss today and till uh, 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 the last topic gis and applications that there are two ppts i am going to present the ppt covers all the topics except gis applications so uh, i request you don't quit from the program uh, stay back till the end of the session see when you see the importance of surveys uh, why do we do surveys for preparing the contour map contour map we already know that the concept of contour map it is elevations elevations it represents elevations earth elevations or terrain elevations and for preparing maps showing engineering details like highways railways canals so uh, we have to do surveys to represent all these features in the form of a map and uh, Uh, maps prepared for making boundaries of countries, states, districts. Obviously, we need to do surveys. And for preparing the topographic map, which shows hills, rivers, forests, and all these topographical features, uh, unless we do surveys, we cannot represent in the form of a map. And for planning and estimating project works like roads, bridges, railways, airports, uh, infrastructure plan, basically, marine and hydrographic surveys also <coughs> one kind of survey. the civil engineer has to do and for preparing a military map also uh, for defense purpose and all uh, we use to prepare military maps of the survey and all and mine surveying is also very important and for preparing archaeological maps and all also the surveys are very important when you see the topographical maps <coughs> the map contains entire india and how do you prepare this topographical maps unless until you do survey for entire india it is difficult to produce topographical maps of each and every part in india and survey of india is the authorized agency to do surveys to prepare plans or maps and to sell maps only authorized agency is survey of india in india and when you take <coughs> united states us geological surveys they are the other agency to uh, prepare maps and sell maps and also when you take uk uh, uh, ordnance surveys department is the other agency to uh, do the surveys of entire country and then uh, they are the other agency to sell the maps so no other private agency or any other agency is not having any authority to sell the maps preparation of maps is okay surveying is also okay but selling the maps is we we are not authorized to sell the maps as a private agency so <coughs> survey of india their mission is to produce maps for entire india and initially um, uh, the survey of india is established itself in 1767 17th or 18th century and they started do surveying for entire country because Uh, unless until we have a map there are no developments at all so that is the reason they started surveying the entire country and prepare maps topographical maps and after preparation of maps they will try to sell that maps to the users and initially they started with 1 is to 1 million scale they started with 1 is to 1 million scale and uh, Uh, to start surveying they divided the entire country into grids they divided the entire country into grids and in this one is to 1 million grid details so 1 million grid is nothing but 4 degrees by 4 degrees interval it means uh, a grid one grid is uh, actually 4 degrees in the x direction that is longitude and another uh 4 uh, degrees in the y direction uh, it means a 4 degree map 1 is to 1 million scale is a 4 degree map and 
by seeing the entire India, uh, maybe 40 to 50 maps they have to produce in this scale. So one is to one million map, a very small scale map it is. Initially, they have developed small scale maps and later on, they are trying to produce large scale maps. So one is to one billion scale. I would like to say why it is small scale. Let's see, <clears throat> the scale is one is to one million. It is nothing but one mm on map is equal to one million mm on ground. It means one mm on map is equal to one kilometer on ground. And uh, this one kilometer, let's say, to represent any feature on map, one mm is not sufficient. At least minimum three mm or four mm is required as a cartography aspects. So this three mm, it means three kilometer or four kilometer road won't be covered in this particular scale. It means there is there are two villages, your village and adjacent village is connected with a three kilometer road, but that three kilometer road not appeared in this particular scale. It means it doesn't support that feature to map in this particular scale. So it is a very small scale. That's what I'm what I'm saying is it is a very small scale. It covers large area, it covers large area with few details, with few details, less details. That is the reason we call it as a small scale. And after developing this one is to one million scale, there is a need to produce large scale maps because more details are very important for us to plan and design the infrastructure. So uh, later on, <laughs> they started working on one is to two lakh fifty thousand scale. It is a one one degree by one degree grid actually. So it means sixteen maps of one is to two lakh fifty thousand maps will be covered in one map of one is to one lakh scale or ten lakh scale. So sixteen maps. See the differences. One grid map of one is to one million will be covered with 16 maps of large scale, one is to 250, 50,000 scale maps. It means the details are more in each and every, every uh, one is to 250,000 scale map compared to one is to one billion scale map. And again, <clears throat> because it is a mission for them and to build maps in a particular scale, they need to work at least 10 to 15 years, 10 to 15 years minimum 10 to 15 years with a large deployment of surveyors, photographers, and also uh, so much manpower is required. And further, they take minimum 10 to 15 years. And to develop another scale map, it is another mission for them, actually. So one is to one million scale is one mission. One is to 250,000 scale is another mission. And one is to 50,000 scale is another mission. That is the reason maximum they could able to develop up to one is to 25,000 scale during the century, last century. So one is to 25,000 scale, maximum they have developed one is to 25,000 scale. And after that, if they want to develop one is to 10,000, it is still larger scale. If they want to develop one is to 10,000 scale, it takes minimum 20, 30 years if they adopt conventional surveying techniques using conventional instruments, whatever instruments that they have used so far is conventional instruments, including leveling, uh, leveling instruments, chain surveying, uh, theodolite surveys, as well as plane table surveys. All these uh, instruments they have used to produce uh, one is to 25,000 scale or one is to 50,000 scale. And developing a large scale map, it is taking for them minimum 20 to 25 or 15 years. So that is the reason they started working on latest technologies because by the time you finish one mission to other mission, you start one mission to other mission. It is taking 20 years. And in these 20 years, there are a lot of developments. Every day there is a development on ground. So these developments are not there in the topographical maps. If you observe the uh, information of recent topographical maps. So that is the reason they started working on new technologies because since invention of computers and software and uh, latest sensors and cameras, uh, remote sensing has come into picture. So remote sensing nowadays, they're using, even Survey of India, they're using, uh, using remote sensing methods or techniques to produce large scale maps because to produce each and every map, they require so much manpower that they can avoid 
and they require so much time that they also can avoid within short period of time they can produce large scale maps with the uh, latest technologies see you can see this is 1 is to 50000 uh, map 1 is to 50000 map and the grid is 1 is to 50000 grid and this is hyderabad area you can see the topographical map uh, of uh, related to hyderabad area you can see uh, hussein sagar lake and uh, uh, Musi River is also there, and there are a few more lakes are all also there on the southern side. And a lot of transportation system is there. Urban development, uh, you can see in the red color, and whatever uh, red color patches are there, those are all urban development areas. And water resources information is available, urban development information is available, and uh, uh, transportation system is also there in the topographical map, and including contours, elevations are also there in the uh, topographical map. That is the advantage that we have with topographical maps uh, for using it for any plans or designs. And see, in a zoomed way, you can check in, uh, zoom in. When we zoom in a particular portion of the topographical map, you can clearly see all the labels, uh, landmarks, and uh, village names, including water bodies and all those things. You can clearly see Musi River is on the southern side. And the Hussein Sagar Lake is on top of it, uh, northeastern side. And now coming to this, this now you understood, I think you understood uh, what is the importance of latest technology, uh, remote sensing, because we need to uh, uh, produce maps in a quick way using the latest technologies. So see what, what latest technologies that we are using right now through the globe. And uh, this is <laughs> remote sensing techniques. Basically, a remote sensing, a remote your sensing is nothing but capturing or observing the earth surface. Okay, so features, observing the features using sensors or cameras, sensing is nothing but, and a remote is nothing but you are observing or capturing the features from a remote location. It means the remote location can have two platforms. One platform is space platform. And another one is airborne platform, spaceborne and airborne platform. There are two types of platforms we have. And the spaceborne platform, usually we keep the satellites in an orbit and then in, in space, and then they, we use it to capture the images of the Earth and its phenomena um, using the spaceborne technology, using satellites and uh, remote sensing. Uh, airborne platform. We also use uh, uh, aircrafts for taking the photographs. It is nothing but photogrammetry technology. We are taking airborne photos using the aircrafts. At the same time, nowadays the drone surveys are there. So drone surveys are also airborne platform because the only the difference is altitude. When it is spaceborne, um, there are three orbits are there. One is low Earth orbit, medium Earth orbit, and high Earth orbit. So 2,000 kilometer, less than 2,000 kilometer, uh, it may be, uh, it can be, it can say that it is a low Earth orbit and medium Earth between 2,000 and 33,000 and 33,000 kilometer uh, orbit. Uh, when we place the satellite at 33,000 kilometer orbit, it is a high orbit satellite system. Usually it is too high in the space and it covers the entire globe in one snapshot. So. That is the advantage that we have with high Earth altitude, high Earth altitude. But thing is, very low resolution images we will get from the uh, high Earth orbit satellite systems. So the resolution is low and uh, coverage is more. Coverage is more. As I said, uh, uh, small scale and large scale. No, here it is large resolution and small resolution. And here, the large resolution we will get if the altitude of the uh, camera is less, uh, let's say drone surveys, the resolution, the imagery resolution is too high when you compare with um, satellite imageries. And when you uh, when you are uh, capturing images through aircraft using uh, uh, aerial flying, then uh, the resolution is different. So the resolution, when you come down from space to uh, near to the ground, usually the images resolution will change and it is higher than the space resolution images that are captured from the space. 
So that is the advantage because the coverage area is less when you uh, come down to the earth. When you come down to the earth from certain level to uh, uh, nearer to the earth. So the coverage area is always less, but the details coverage is very, uh, uh, too much details will be uh, there in the uh, uh, images that you capture from drone and aerial surveys. Whereas in spacecraft, uh, uh, in spacecraft usually uh, the resolution may be high, but uh, the thing is uh, the coverage area is too large. So we can develop large scale topographical maps using uh, airborne technology, airborne technology, drone and as well as uh, aerial photographs are comes under airborne technology. Whereas uh, we can develop small scale as well as some medium and large scale uh, topographical maps we can develop from space technology, space technology. So the difference is the platform here. So one platform is satellite and sensors. Another platform is aircraft and cameras. And the third platform is drone and camera. So, and altitude difference is there. If the altitude is less, then you will get large scale images, the large, large scale maps or large scale images. Okay, so that is the difference between uh, 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 large scale and small scale when it comes to satellite images, uh, aerial photographs or drone images. And other terrestrial uh, instruments are also you, their total station is there, GPS is there, global positioning system, stands for global positioning system, GPS, and GPR, ground penetrating radar. So, and one more thing is LIDAR surveys, that is also very important, LIDAR uh, surveys, uh, captures the ground elevations straight away using the uh, LIDAR is uh, uh, stands for light detection and ranging, light detection and ranging. It sends light signals and then uh, reflected signals will be tracked in the form of uh, uh, elevations of the earth. So whatever LIDAR data, that LIDAR data consists of elevations of the objects on earth, only elevations, it doesn't give you the plan. Okay, whereas in uh, aerial photographs, it will give you uh, elevations at the same time. It also gives you the plan of the features also. So footprints, nothing but footprints of uh, any developments and all buildings or whatever you call, whatever exists in your study area, that everything is visible as it is uh, what we see on the ground that can be seen through aerial photographs, but lighter only it is elevation data is available. And Total station GPS and GPR. GPR is ground penetrating radar. So, so this is another technique only we use to uh, capture the subsurface uh, features through GPR, ground penetrating radar. So, uh, usually uh, they send radar or radio signals into the ground, and the reflected signals they will be captured in the form of distances from the ground. So, so we can say. Uh, we can use GPR to detect all uh, underground utilities that are there uh, uh, in the study area. So this kind of survey is also another survey, but it doesn't come under remote sensing. And uh, GPS is, uh, we all know that GPS we are using in mobiles as well as uh, for navigation system also we are using GPS. And the total station, it is a well-known uh, instrument for uh, surveying and establishing control points and capturing all the observations on ground physically, not remote sensing. So the top one uh, is uh, remote sensing techniques and the bottom one is a terrestrial uh, or conventional technique, so in instruments that we are using for service. So these many methods or technologies that we are using for creating the maps. Am I audible? Am I audible? Yes, sir, you're audible, sir. So, uh, I told you already what is large scale and small scale. And smaller amount of area, large scale is, it covers small area and greater amount of details. And even though it is small area, it is covering, but greater details are available in large scale. And like one is to 1000 is a large scale. 
and when it comes to small scale it covers a large area but few details are available in the small scale as i told you uh, with all the examples uh, in the previous slides and uh, scale uh, one is to one million scale is a small scale even one is to two lakh fifty thousand scale is also a small scale one is to fifty thousand scale is a medium scale and one is to twenty five thousand scale uh, when it comes to topographical mapping by uh, survey field uh, one is to twenty five thousand scale is also still larger scale compared to one is to fifty thousand scale and uh, even larger scale they want to develop now they are in the process to develop one is to ten thousand scale maps also for entire India. Using the latest technologies, not conventional technologies, because of time and other uh, economy and other things, also they need to work out. That is the reason uh, they are using latest technologies to uh, prepare the maps quickly. And you can see uh, the difference in large scale and small scale. In a country level, when you see the coastline. So the same coastline in a state level, it is a large scale compared to country level. So uh, an image is a large scale map in state level, and you can see some more details. The coastline is with few more details compared to country level coastline, and you can also see the district level. The same coastline you can see in the district level also because it is still larger than the state level map or country level map. So you can see. Uh, uh, a detailed uh, uh, the det more details are available along the coastline. It's kings, karus, and everything can be seen in the district level. So the scale of the map when you see uh, large scale to small scale, how it varies feature wise. So the process in remote sensing and photogrammetry. I told you the photogrammetry. Uh, it is also comes under remote sensing. Only thing is platform varies. So aerial photographs and drone photos all comes under photogrammetry uh, inputs. And remote sensing satellite images are uh, uh, because you are capturing the images through satellites uh, uh, using satellite image remote sensing. So photo is nothing but picture. Photogrammetry, grammetry is nothing but measurement. So uh, measuring objects from the photographs. Interpreting and measuring objects from the photographs, including the measurements, includes uh, x, y, distance, perimeters, uh, heights. Everything can be measured. Each and every object that is visible on the photograph can be measured straight away with your computer system. No need to go to the ground and uh, collect the information or measurements by using tape or any other conventional instruments. Once you develop a photogrammetry system of your study area the measurements are very easy here you can straight away work out each and every object and its lengths areas and perimeters and heights can be measured so that the planning process is very easy uh, uh, the advantage that we have with photogrammetry is virtually you have the entire study area in your computer system so no need to go to the ground and visit again and again for some reference or some planning so what is the advantage? Entire terrain is visible in the photogrammetry, including the terrain, including the objects that are there on the ground. Everything can be seen straight away in the computer system once you develop a photogrammetry system for, for your study area. So seven elements of remote sensing process, we, uh, uh, because the energy is very important. There are two types of remote sensing. Broadly, if we speak, there are two types of remote sensing. One is active remote sensing and another one is passive remote sensing. And to sense any object or to capture any object, we require a light okay, energy. So that energy, usually we get it from the sun and, and sometimes we may get it through an instrument, okay, the photo or, uh, or the light, we will get it either through natural source or through artificial source. So the best example, of passive and active remote sensing is a camera with a flash and a camera without a flash. When you operate camera without a flash, that is a passive remote sensing. When you operate camera with flash, it is an active remote sensing. So most of the sensors are there in the satellite system. Many satellites are placed with a combination of active remote sensing sensors and the passive remote sensing sensors. Initially, they illuminate the light and then the light passes through the atmosphere 
and then it interacts with the target or objects on the ground and then the reflection takes place the reflected readings will be recorded in the computer system and the readings are in the form of images the reflected readings are in the form of images so the images ultimately the product from a uh, remote sensing is an image the product from a remote sensing is an image it's nothing but a map it may not be straight away interpretable uh, you need some expertise to interpret the features from the imagery but it is ultimately a map but the map is not to scale initially because uh, once you capture the images through the satellites it is a raw image but you need to adjust the image adjust the image to the ground coordinate system it is nothing but you have to reference the, uh, uh, the image with the ground coordinate system with the latitudes and longitudes then we can use that image or map as a standard map like topographical map see the scale of aerial photograph um, uh, i told you already if the altitude is high and then the scale is less if the altitude is less the scale is large so uh, when you fly with an uh, with an aircraft and take the photographs with a high altitude the scale of the photographs are less small scale and the scale of the photographs are large scale and you can determine the scale by using focal length and altitude uh, these two parameters will define the scale of the uh, aircraft uh, photograph and this uh, there is a flight plan initially you need to develop either uh, even if it is drone or uh, uh, aircraft you need to develop a flight plan flight plan initially and then after once you complete the flight plan according to the plan you need to fly you need to fly the aircraft or fly the drone and these are the strips of photographs it will take from the uh, altitude and obviously there is an overlap between the two photographs this overlap will bring you a three dimension initially okay so we need to maintain 60 to 70% side overlap and uh, lateral overlap minimum 25 to 40% we need to maintain so it means a common portion is must be available between two photographs so that you can see those images in a 3d mode okay so using a parallax uh, concept so this process uh, softwares are available hardware is there and you can develop all this uh, 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 process in the software itself and then you can produce rectified maps so whatever maps that we produce uh, or photographs that we produce in the photogrammetry system it will match with the ground coordinate system each and every feature will match with the ground coordinate system <clears throat> so uh, you can see the photo photo 1 photo 2 photo 3 so like that it will capture and the photogrammetry process is a large uh, uh, actually there are so many tasks in the photogrammetry process and uh, uh, actually it takes so much time uh to explain all this process and all we need to use the softwares initially you need to take the raw images and then process the images uh, rectifying the images with ground control points and uh, after trying it in the terrain uh, it will set to the ground coordinate system and then once it is set the images can be uh, rectified and the rectified images directly or photographs directly we can use for mapping or analysis or decision support system so raw image versus rectified ortho image or photo so raw image versus rectified image okay so raw images we, we normally don't use for a uh, straight away for planning only rectified images we use rectification process will takes in the uh, will take uh, in the software uh, modules and remote sensing data when we see uh, this is a 30 meter low resolution means it has captured from very high altitude whereas this 1 meter high resolution satellite image is captured from bit low altitude so that is the difference that you can see if you reduce the altitude from the ground you will get the second image if you if you increase the altitude uh, of a, a satellite system you will get the first image so see the details that are available uh, with the first image and the second image the details are many in the second image including building building footprints also can be covered it means when you talk about resolution resolution is nothing but um, uh, the smallest object that can resolve by a sensor it means a 1 meter on 1 meter object when i say 1 meter high resolution no? 
So a one meter by one meter object can be seen on the second image. We, we can identify that one meter by one meter object on the second image. But whereas in the first image, it is difficult to identify even 30 meter by 30 meter uh, object on the image. So that is the difference between uh, <clears throat> low resolution and high resolution. And obviously the high resolution images will provide you to develop large scale topographical maps and the low resolution images will give you a facility to develop large uh, small scale topographical maps. So that is the relation between scale and resolution. And obviously as a surveyor, you should know the triangulation, how it controls, uh, how we take ground control points to establish ground control points. We need to use two GPS uh, uh, total station. And here, I just want to mention you uh, to establish ground control points in your study area. Obviously, definitely you require total stations, conventional instruments, DGPS, and all these instruments are very much required to establish ground control points. But for surveying and all, for the entire objects on the study area, that can be possible through remote sensing methods. So a conjunction of conventional surveying instruments at the same time, we need to use the latest technologies to develop a particular project in books. So uh, this, this is this is this point we should note down uh, when you want to uh, use these uh, technologies uh, before proceeding to establish an infrastructure. And these are all control points. So these control points are very much essential to um, align the photographs or images. Yeah, this entire thing is in, uh, is available. How to align the photographs? How to rectify the photographs? That process is uh, with softwares, and uh, we call it as ground control points. So ground control points are very important to uh, align the photographs to match with the ground. And these are all, uh, we can develop three-dimensional models using the stereo photographs or overlapping photographs. And this is uh, in software, uh, everything is in software, and the processes. And the components in the uh, airborne system is aircraft or satellite, uh, energy source, active and passive source. I told you what is active source and passive source. Pilot is required to fly. Digital matter camera sensors are also required to capture the images or photographs. And hardware and software is very important. Very high-end hardware and software is important to process the photographs because the resolution of the images are too high. If you open the images, if you want to open the uh, images in your laptops or on normal desktops, it is difficult because in a study area, when you are working on an entire district, normally thousands of images are there, okay? High resolution images, you have to capture through the uh, latest technologies. And all these thousand images you need to open into your software. It means you require a very high-end system, including RAM and display component graphics cards. And also a special hardware is required to uh, map the 3D model. So all this hardware and software and uh, display system is also very important and your monitor must be very uh, uh, high-end monitor, very much, very high-end monitor. And photogrammetry remote sensing analysts are required uh, because uh, this is uh, usually the expertise is required to operate, uh, to take the photographs and to collect the photographs, to rectify the photographs and use it for analysis. Uh, experts are very much required and users are also one component. Once the images are developed by these experts, the images can straight away used by the engineer scientists for their analysis and decision making. Products from uh, photogrammetry process. Uh, see, our raw images are inputs. Ground control points are also inputs to collect the images or to adjust the images to the ground. And the brake lines and contours. Brake lines are nothing but your uh, Undulations on ground, undulations on ground. And contours are elevations. This also we can generate from the photographs straight away using 
ground control points and the five images. And ortho photo is nothing but a rectified photo. It is a two-dimensional photo. You can use it as a standard topographical map. And uh, digital surface model, digital elevation model, digital terrain model, all these are three-dimensional models we can develop because the photographs are having overlap and uh, we can uh, do 3D modeling also. And mosaic of photos. So if there are 10 or 15 photographs in your area, we can mosaic into one image. Nothing but clubbing all the images into one image. So process in remote sensing and photogrammetry, uh, I told you already what sort of process is there with softwares and hardwares. And uh, uh, before software, using of software and all, uh, what uh, sort of inputs that required and all I discussed. And uh, softwares, list of softwares are also, too many softwares are there. Uh, satellite aerial photo data processing softwares are separate. GPR softwares are separate. And LiDAR, to process LiDAR data, uh, softwares are different. To process drone data software, the softwares are different. And to integrate all the inputs uh, into a GIS system, GIS softwares are different. And mostly, uh, the softwares are bundled with so many modules. So, uh, varies from basic uh, uh, software to high-end software. In the same software, you have basic module and high-end module. So this kind of uh, facility they will provide so that one can purchase a basic module or one can purchase a high-end module. So <clears throat> this is uh, uh, the information that we have to see what sort of softwares usually we use for processing uh, using these latest technologies. And open source softwares are there. Some are open source softwares are there. Some are free softwares are there. Some are proprietary software server. We need to purchase if at all if it is proprietary. And most of the high-end capability the software systems are proprietary systems only. And open source softwares are basic facilities are available in many open source softwares. But sometimes we need to use both basic as well as open source, as well as sometimes we need to use proprietary softwares also to utilize all the tools that are available for processing the images. And you can see there is a 3D MOS. Normally, uh, for 3D photogrammetry, we use 3D MOS. It's a six button or nine button MOS is available. And uh, the MOS cost itself is more than 40,000, 50,000. Uh, and uh, 3D glosses are also there. This is also cost around uh, 40 to 50,000. I uh, don't know exact cost of uh, uh, right now. And the workstations are very important, not desktops and all. Workstations are very important because it process the images quickly compared to uh, desktops and laptops. And you also have softwares like uh, compression softwares are also must be available. Compression, compressing images because every time <clears throat> they are collecting images, but the imagery, one imagery is more than two GB, three GB because high resolution images. So all these images, you can compress it and later you can uh, process those images. Compression softwares, very dedicated compression softwares are also available. You can compress a 1 GB image into uh, 1 MB image. The clarity you normally you doesn't lose. So benefits of space aerial service. So it produces an actual and permanent photographic record. So why it is said that photographic record? Usually when you want to develop a land information system using the photography images, photogrammetry images. So they will keep it as a record. They will keep it as a record. Today, the boundaries are like this. And after one year, the boundaries are changed. So this will give you a straightaway record. It's a proof for them if they fly and take the photographs every year, usually, in US and UK and uh, some other advanced countries, every time, every year they fly with aircrafts and take the photographs of the area and develop their land information system because every day there is a change. A dynamic change is there because land information is such a way that you need to develop that kind of information uh, because the problem is too high in the land information system. So they will try to track with the aerial photographs only. And, cost effective and consume less time. So flying one, two, maximum two days or three days is required to fly entire district and take the photographs. And the processing time is around maximum one month. So you can develop the entire district large scale maps in one, two months with a, a big number of team and all. 
So software team must be there and some surveyors also must be there to establish the control points and also uh, some sort of uh, conceptual experts are also important. And one thing is, it is not useful uh, when it comes to aerial photographs uh, because only daylight only it takes photographs. And the night time, it is difficult to take photographs and photographs are not there because only passive remote sensing it adopts uh, using the aircrafts, only daytime only. And another disadvantage with aerial photographs or uh, flying is uh, only uh, during the cloud and uh, other uh, uh, atmospheric uh, changes, uh, the photographs are not clear. So that is the reason we always need to uh, check whether the weather is clear or not uh, to take the photographs. And drawbacks are also, I, I told you already, the drawbacks of uh, early photographs. Hidden areas caused by human-made objects and uh, uh, expertise manpower is uh, 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 a different kind of expertise is uh, required to manage this kind of application. And during winds, clouds, uh, and other climatic conditions, uh, it is not effective because image quality uh, is deprived. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to LiDAR and aerial versus drone, so this is also another important thing. Uh, LiDAR only gives you the height elevations above the ground. So the terrain elevations or object elevations can be captured through LiDAR. And, uh, um, very accurate, uh, very accurate compared to aerial photographs and satellite remote sensing. So LiDAR data in terms of elevations, I'm talking about because only LiDAR gives you only elevations. So these elevation data, you can straight away work with LiDAR data. And LiDAR advantage is it is a microwave remote sensing. Normally it can capture in the uh, night also, the images, all weather system it is. Any weather conditions, you can capture the LiDAR images. Okay, so that is the advantage. And another advantage is inaccessible areas, like complicated terrains, you can use LiDAR data to collect the elevations. And when it comes to GIS, and this is a geographical information system that provides the tools for creating, managing, analyzing, and visualizing the data. So whatever data that you collect from different departments, the data can be in a different scale. The data may be different like geology data is there, soil data is there, land use data is there, land information system data is there. So you are, you are collecting data from different departments or from different surveys from different methods or technologies. And all this data you can integrate using the GA softwares. So that is the advantage that we have. Once you integrate the data in GIS system, you can take decisions to uh, manage any sort of application. Okay, So that is the advantage that we have with GIS. Uh, uses uh, uh, planning and site location. We can uh, locate very accurate, uh, uh, very feasible site locations. We can, uh, let's say for uh, dam locations or uh, uh, any infrastructure uh, to locate, uh, to establish any infrastructure, we can select it feasible sites and all, water resources engineering, transportation engineering, and every vertical we can use, because that is the reason I'm saying that GIS is an interdisciplinary uh, subject. And most of the data that is uh, the produce in GIS is in the form of layers or maps, thematic layers, what we call it as thematic layers. And once you have all these thematic layers, it depends on uh, thematic layers, what sort of thematic layers that we have to produce for a particular project. Uh, it depends on the project and its scale and its financial things and all we need to look into to develop all this database. You can see the slope maps, DGM, digital elevation models, aspect and 3D models also you can develop. And you see uh, the images that you can see in 1983, uh, uh, one, uh, one city, Ottawa, is there, Canada. So how it is developed in 1984 and in 1996, how the developments have happened and all. This kind of uh, change detection also you can find out uh, through these remote sensing images. Not only producing topographical maps, you can also uh, check the change detections like land information, land parcel information, land boundaries changes, all these things you can 
straight away incorporate from the satellite images and other things. And you can see in 1994, uh, the satellite images and uh, below there are a lot of changes are there. The urban areas are there uh, in 1996. Within two years, the developments are happening. So this kind of change detection you can observe through remote sensing data. In 1974, the red color patches are urban areas and in 1994, within uh, another after 20 years, if you check with another imagery, satellite imagery, uh, the yellow color patches are urban areas. So urban areas are uh, a development of urban areas, how it has developed or evolved uh, during these 20 years ago. So this kind of uh, uh, statistical analysis also we can manage uh, using the remote sensing data sets. Uh, this is how <coughs> the first presentation uh, against, and I will I'll quickly go through the second one application on civil engineering because every civil engineer has to watch that application. And uh, these all these technologies uh, mostly we use for this application. Uh, uh, we can use that uh, uh, concepts to this application. I will just uh, uh, share another screen. And I will share another. Uh, I will share another PPT. Uh, this one, I think. See, urban stormwater modeling using EPOS WMM and GS. So we have used GS tools to develop an urban stormwater modeling. Uh, and uh, the prerequisites for developing an urban stormwater modeling for a particular city or urban area, as you know that all cities nowadays are vulnerable throughout the globe. Any countries we take. All cities are vulnerable to floods. And uh, even if the city is in a coastal city or inland city or uh, high undulating terrain, if the city is located in high undulating terrain also, vulnerable to floods. Okay. So these floods and how do we control the floods through uh, a proper stormwater management model for all the cities and all. See, when it comes to see uh, how actually a city uh, has been flooded uh, due to some intense rainfall. And uh, to manage this kind of application, uh, the prerequisites are topographical survey and mapping is very important because you need to capture the ground elevations because unless until you have a ground elevations of uh, uh, your city, it is difficult to uh, manage or simulate the uh, terrain. It is difficult to manage and simulate the terrain. And the collection of information regarding the rainfall intensity and runoff, because the intensity of rainfall, you need to check, uh, collect the information about the rainfall data, cost records, climate data, and everything you need to collect it, uh, because you need to uh, go with that uh, uh, highest rainfall intensity and what sort of uh, uh, return period, whether it is a two year return period, the return period the rainfall is, or a five year or a 10 year return period. Uh, let's see. Uh, very recent floods are 100 years return period is there. When you, talk, when you take Chennai flood in 2015 and in 2020, when you take Kolpata flood. So uh, it is 100 year return period. Large volume of water is there and flooded with entire uh, districts or uh, entire state and all. But in the region, uh, the return period also we have to calculate. Uh, and mostly the stormwater network or sewerage or stormwater network we design for only two to three years return period, two to three years uh, return period rainfall. It means maximum it can pop up up to a one hour or two hours rainfall. Whatever storm water network that you are going to design for a city must pop up with a one hour or two hour intense rainfall. More than that, if rainfall happens, it is difficult to control the flood. So that is the reason. And if you want to increase, Collecting levels at every 20 meter interval, that is the terrain levels, convention levels also, you need to use it. And 
land use pattern is also very important because land use urban areas mostly uh, accommodate with commercial industrial as well as uh, residential and open areas greenery areas all those things are there but greenery green areas are very less when you take into account in an urban area that is the reason the flooding is more the flood is very quick actually because of the imperviousness of the surfaces and to assess the estimation of the flood quality, you know, carrying capacity of the canals, local tanks, reservoirs, and proposed suitable measures. Uh, so this uh, water uh, carrying capacity of all these water bodies or uh, rivers can also be assessed through this system. And uh, we can use rational method because it's an urban area uh, for finding out the flood discharge and how much quantity of flood uh, usually uh, happens in a particular time. Uh, in a rainfall event. So that can be calculated using the rational method. Rational method is uh, quite uh, feasible for uh, simulation of urban uh, stormwater network. And uh, twice in one year, once in one year, or once in two years. Maximum if we take these written periods. Otherwise, if you take uh, uh, twice in one year, or once in one year, or once in two years, it is okay because the pipe diameters, when you want to simulate, it is. Uh, it can accommodate. The pipes can accommodate on along the road network. No? So, <coughs> along the road network, uh, uh, the diameter of the pipe must be uh, must accommodate with the road network. That is one important thing. That is only the reason we only take twice in one year, once in one year, and once in two years written period rainfalls. And more than that, if you take five year rainfall. 10 year rainfall or 20 year rainfall, the flood volume increases vastly and difficult to uh, convey the water to the outlets. So that is the disadvantage that we have if we take five year or 10 year. Most of the cities, they use uh, this twice in one year or once in one year, maximum once in two years or once in five years. And the Manning's formula we usually adopt for uh, designing the pipe to the parameters, including diameter and uh, its uh, radius and all those things. And this is the process flowchart that we can implement for uh, designing a stormwater network model. And rainfall runoff and drainage network simulation can be uh, done using this process. Uh, the collection of rainfall data, whatever I told you, ideas calls you have to develop uh, intensity, duration, frequency calls for the rainfall events. And geospatial data base is also uh, very important because we have to integrate all the data that we have collected from different uh, surveys and departments. And finally, estimate the peak flows and whatever peak flows are there, whether the carrying capacity of the pipe is uh, capable to convey the water to the outlet or not. This system simulation can be seen straight away using the EPA SWM. It is a software, uh, a freeware, but anybody can use this and apply the concept. And uh, different softwares, we can use it for this application, uh, including remote sensing, GIS softwares, as well as uh, simulation softwares. The overall process, I told you what sort of uh, process it is. And the images, uh, we can use satellite images here also to develop the land use because land use is a very important factor for flood and slope also very important. So further, we can use satellite images and all. And this is the land use and imperviousness. Percentage imperviousness, you can see straight away residential, it is less. And for uh, roads and paved surfaces, it is one maximum. Imperviousness is, uh, is maximum in or paved surfaces. And these are the software tools that are available to process the document uh, application. And the hydraulic analysis, you can see the network as well as you can see all the profile of a, a water conveying system in a conduit. So this kind of uh, simulation, you can check whether it is crossing the hydraulic gradient line or any other things can be observed through the simulation of each and every pipe. And uh, uh, we can also observe the overflow at any junction. Those nodes are junctions or manholes. And uh, solutions also we can uh, give through this system. Uh, once it is simulated, we can do proper solutions where to connect, uh, where we have to put certain structures to convey the water properly and all those things. 
and the reports also note discharge pipe discharges and uh, storage volumes surcharging and nothing but overflow of a conduit or manhole this kind of reports also we can get it and uh, simulation also uh, can be seen straight away on the satellite image uh, once you generate the reports from the uh, uh, SWM. And there are so many measures. Everyone knows that how to control the flood and all uh, uh, with so many measures, improve the greenery as well as uh, uh, continuous water resources uh, like uh, reservoirs must be there. Reservoirs should not be occupied with built up areas and all. So uh, uh, there are many things are there. Whatever drainage system, natural drainage system should not be get obstructed for flow. So this kind of uh, uh, things we need to take care uh, to arrest floods. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for your wonderful and uh, informative uh, presentation. So now we would like to have a few more minutes of you, sir, as our participants sir, have framed some questions yes. which they would like to be answered by you. Yeah, please. So the first question is from Muhammad Ali. Yeah. Which imaging satellites can provide highest temporal resolution for a specific area? See, here temporal resolution is nothing but uh, how often we collect a satellite imagery through a sensor. It means if we collect images of the area, if you take one area, if you collect images, how frequently you can collect the images of the same area. That is nothing but temporal resolution. So temporal resolution, there are many satellite systems they provide. Some satellites, you can take uh, pictures of the same area in two days. Some satellites you can take pictures in 14 days. Some satellites you can take pictures like Landsat, you have only 15 days or 14 days temporal resolution. Whereas in IRS system, we also have uh, 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 eight days or nine days uh, temporal resolution is there, some satellites. And uh, some other satellites also there, IRS system, Landsat, spot systems are there. And nowadays the temporal resolution has been uh, highly improved by the private agencies because space agency, uh, private agencies are also uh, uh, actively involved to collect the satellite images like Fitbird, uh, Iconos, and all these images you can get it in one day or two day uh, temporal resolution. I hope you got the answer. Thank you, sir. Uh, the second question is from Arun Kumar. Yeah. Uh, why satellites are placed at different altitudes when we can get high resolution and detailed pictures from lower altitudes? So basically, uh, when, the, in, uh, when the space program is started in 1960s or 70s, that time the technology is not supportive to place the satellites to uh, sit in altitude. And the, and the problem here is the sensors and the technology is not readily available at that time. So they used to place satellites at higher altitudes to take the pictures of the earth. That is the reason initially they started taking the low resolution images. And then after uh, the support of technology in 1990s and 2000s and 2010s, you have uh, a lot of options with uh, so many satellite systems, including private agencies. So uh, this kind of uh, high resolution satellite systems are now, it is available in everywhere from every country. I hope you got the answer. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next question we have is, how deep a satellite's vision can be penetrated into the Earth's surface? So Earth's surface usually top uh, up to one meter or maximum, some uh, microwave images or sensors can penetrate into the uh, maximum top soil only. So more than that, uh, it is difficult to capture the uh, information about the soil or Earth. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next question we have is from Firoz. Is there a relationship between water quality characteristics in situ and remote sensing technology? Yes, 
uh, water quality uh, some parameters only we can detect uh, through uh, remote sensing water quality parameters and uh, mostly suspended solids uh, solids suspended solids pH and uh, some sort of uh, quality parameters only few quality parameters out of many 10 or 20 parameters important parameters to study the water uh, uh, its pollutants only three or four pollutants uh, to detect these three or four pollutants uh, using uh, satellite remote sensing techniques not all thank you sir uh, the next question is the stealth technology used in fighter jets is it related to remote sensing pardon uh, can you repeat it again the stealth technology which is used in fighter jets is that related to remote sensing uh, I think, uh, it is uh, out of our topic it seems I think. probably i need to find out okay sir we'll go for the next question it is from mukesh uh, which remote sensing and gis techniques are suitable for studying urban agriculture urban agriculture yes sir so uh, any high resolution images are supportive because because it is urban area we need to use high resolution images uh, to find out the patches and agriculture patches so definitely there are so many images and sensors are available uh, and you can use those high resolution images because it is an urban area for finding out the agriculture patches. As well as uh, you can also yes, use medium resolution images also. Uh, I hope you got the answer. Next question is how GIS and remote sensing are useful in defense sector? Yeah, I told you, you no know, uh, digital elevation models you can uh, develop in the complicated terrains like uh, uh, the positions at the borders and all. And uh, because uh, you can uh, give a lucid analysis also, you can manage uh, a lucid analysis. Basically, uh, a point uh, where exactly we can detect a point uh, uh, from a particular location. So this kind of slope and lucid analysis and uh, uh, for different applications once the 3D model is developed from the uh, photogrammetry systems. To target uh, opponents. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next question is remote sensing. If the energy coming from source, the same amount of energy will reach the applicant. No, but there is always a, a loss in the energy uh, when it travels from the source to the target. And then after reflection, there is always a loss. So that is the reason. Uh, some loss is there in the energy uh, and we need to take it into account while taking the pictures. Thank you, sir. And we have one last question. Yeah. Which software is easy uh, with regards to remote sensing and at the same time uh, from uh, which can be given all information? Uh, probably, uh, mostly we can use uh, proprietary softwares like uh, if it is remote sensing, we can use Eridos is there, Eridos is a proprietary software. And uh, you also have open source softwares like Grass and uh, NV and all those softwares are also available. And uh, uh, those softwares also provide a full uh, uh, fledged tools for interpreting the images. Thank you so much, sir, for giving uh, the answers to all the participants. And I hope uh, all the participants who have asked their questions got their answers. Uh, so on behalf of uh, Gates Institute of Technology and Civil Engineering Department, we thank you a lot, sir. Thanks for your informative session. And uh, we look forward for more sessions from you. And before ending this session, I would like to invite my colleague, Muhammad Ali, to give his word of thanks. Thanks for the wonderful session. Today's session was informative and knowledgeable. We look forward for more sessions with you, sir. So, what of thanks. Good afternoon, all. 
I feel privileged on this occasion to deliver my vote of thanks for the fourth day of FTP on emerging trends in civil engineering. Firstly, I would like to convey our sincere thanks to today's resource person, Dr. C. H. Ramesh Naidu, sir. I would like to convey my special thanks to our correspondent, Madam V. K. Padma Vatama Garu, Managing Director, Sri G. Raghunath Reddy Garu. Director Madam Srimati V K Srivani Garu and our beloved principal sir Dr P Baskar Patel for their motivation, support and encouragement. I would like to heartful thanks to my fellow faculty members who have been supporting me in all tasks for organizing this FTP. Last but not least, I thank all the participants throughout the country and across the globe for your time and patience in making fourth day of FTP a grand success. We wish your presence for the tomorrow session. Now we are closing the session on count five. Five, four, three, two, one.